All right, welcome everybody. You can, can you turn, turn my mic down a bit? However, just however much it needs to, for the people in this, whoever's like halfway back to hear me. Um, welcome to the first equipping night of 2024 and my personal first equipping night. I know these have been going for about a year, I think. Joseph Ray and, and the team got these started. Um, so just if, if this is new to you or if you need a reminder of, uh, of what these are, how often we have these meetings. These are going to be once a month, uh, usually on the last Wednesday of the month, but not always. So just so you know, the next meeting is February 28th, same time, and we intentionally do it to coincide with youth group and children's ministry stuff, so there's something for the whole family. And uh, the topic and just, you know, sometimes I'll be speaking at these. Uh, sometimes it'll be a guest speaker, maybe in person, maybe even a live Zoom. Sometimes it'll be a panel interview. Uh, the format will change depending on the topic and the need. Um, s- and the topic for the February meeting is still not decided. So something I want to make sure you know for equipping nights, if there's something that you think would be helpful for us to discuss, just let me know. Uh, you can email me. It's just matt at cccwnc.com. Some of you have my number, uh, and then you all know where I work. So do just come and see me, and um, and I can't make, I can't promise to do every single topic, but it's good to keep my ears open. So if I hear something repeated, or if I just think one of the ideas is 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 really tremendous, and yes, we need to talk about it, we will. Um, so let me get my slide app up here. Here we go. So just so you know, the mission of Equipping Nights, really what these are all about, is that we're trying, these nights are all about forming a biblical worldview from all of Scripture to all of life. we, We really want to leave no stone unturned. We're really trying to fill in the cracks of information that you might not get on a normal Sunday morning or that we might not be able to address all in a normal sermon or even in your community groups. Um, So some nights will emphasize the all of Scripture. Like tonight, we're going to talk about a part of the Bible that might be strange, even controversial, hard to understand. And then other nights, um, like before, I think the most recent one, before I started working here, was a, a talk on uh, immigration and how we can view that biblically. So some nights we'll have an emphasis on all of life. Uh, we're going to talk about a life topic and then bring scripture in. Uh, but no matter what the night is, we're trying to connect scripture to life, uh, all of it. So we want to talk about all of scripture for all of life, even the parts of scripture that are really, really hard to talk about, uh, maybe even uncomfortable to talk about, which brings us to tonight's topic, uh, which is What do we do with the imprecatory psalms? Uh, I've gotten a lot of feedback already, and and I'm glad I'm getting this. Hey, this is the first time I've heard this word. I didn't even know what to call it. So let's just say it out loud a few times, make sure we can pronounce it. All right, so on three, we'll say it together. One, two, three, imprecatory. Okay, second word exercise we're going to do is the noun. So that's, this is the adjective, right? And describing it, imprecatory. The noun is imprecation, imprecation, ready, one, two, three, imprecation, there we go, I think I said that right, this is being live streamed and recorded, if I was wrong on that, that'll be embarrassing, Um, but it really just, the word means to curse, so what we're talking about tonight is any psalm, and usually it's just a few verses from a given psalm, but any psalm that asks God to call a curse down on his enemies, and uh, that's a topic that I need the Lord's help in. We all need the Lord's help in to talk about. So uh, let's, let me open in prayer, and then we'll get started. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for all of it. We need all of it in our life, even the parts that are hard to talk about, like tonight. So Lord, I pray that you would give me wisdom and clarity Give us all minds and hearts to be receptive to your truth. And Lord, do um, use this to increase our love of you and even our love of our neighbor. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so 
anytime we talk about a part of Scripture which can be difficult to understand or even um, or can even be controversial, uh, I want to start with this non-negotiable truth. And uh, I just want to go ahead and say from the get-go, this lesson is not Bible light. There's tons of Scripture. I've put a lot of the Scripture on slides to avoid to, so you wouldn't have to flip across your Bibles a ton. Um, and forgot to mention, if you didn't already grab a handout that's in the back, it will be helpful for you uh, to follow along because there's lots of information here. Um, but if you were to pick one verse that really talks about who we are as Christ Community Church and really the, the, the where we want to stand on everything, it's really hard to beat 2 Timothy 3, 16 through 17, which says, All Scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. So emphasis on three things. One, all Scripture, every jot and tittle of the Old and New Testament is breathed out by God. That's where we get the word inspiration. When we say Scripture is inspired by God, it's breathed out by God. And, and not only is it breathed out by God, all Scripture is profitable. All Scripture is good for us in some way. And third thing, it equips us. I, I haven't been able to confirm this, but I imagine when Joseph started equipping knights, it might have been this verse that came to his mind. Uh, so we're starting with the presupposition, with the agreement that all Scripture is breathed out by God, all Scripture is profitable and then we come to a psalm like Psalm 137, which will be uh, the first example of an imprecatory psalm that we see tonight. So I'll read this here. It starts in verse 1. By the waters of Babylon, there we sat down and wept when we remembered Zion. On the willows there we hung up our lyres. For there our captors required of us songs and our tormentors mirth, saying, Sing us one of the songs of Zion. But how shall we sing the Lord's song in a foreign land? If I forget you, O Jerusalem, let my right hand forget its skill. Let my tongue stick to the roof of my mouth. If I do not remember you, if I do not set Jerusalem above my highest joy. Okay, so far so good. It starts off as an ordinary lament. Now buckle up. Verse 7. Remember, O Lord, against the Edomites the day of Jerusalem. How they said, lay it bare, lay it bare, down to its foundations. O daughter of Zion, doomed to be destroyed, blessed shall he be who repays you with what you have done to us. Blessed shall he be who takes your little ones, your children, and dashes them against the rock. And that's where the psalm ends. When I was in high school, I played on the football team, and I was on the offensive line. Um, a little bit larger then, but I played on the offensive line, and there was a, another guy that played on the offensive line whose name was Norman. We called him Storm and Norman, and that name was really more ironic than it was true because his personality was not Stormin by default. He was uh, kind of a smaller guy. They just put him there because he wasn't that athletic. He was uh, didn't get much playing time. He was uh, kind of quiet. But what was really cool was that over time, you could see him start to get more comfortable with his teammates and even get more vocal the way he cheered on his teammates from the sideline. And I still remember this one time so clear in my mind. Uh, we, our team was on defense. I played on the offensive line, so I was on the sideline. And per usual, we're cheering on our defense in the ways that we normally would. Let's go, D. Hit him hard, D. Watch the pass, D. Uh, and then Norman... Storm and Norman blurts out, break their bones. <laughs> and we were all just taken aback like, Norman, like that's, that's pretty uncalled for, don't you think? And sometimes that's what it can feel like to read the imprecatory Psalms. Look, we want God's team to win and we want the enemy to lose, but is such graphic language necessary or appropriate? It's a good question. Well, for Norman, I don't think it's ever appropriate in football to wish that an opponent would break their leg. But this prayer is in the Bible. And it's not just an example of a prayer, good or bad. It's a psalm given to us as a model for prayer. 
So there has to be at least some circumstance into which this prayer was appropriate. And then we'll also talk about, is it appropriate for today? Now, Psalm 137 is probably the most graphic of the imprecatory psalms. So we're, we're not hiding any deeper, darker psalm from you tonight. We, we, we gave you probably the, one of the most, uh, the hardest examples of one. But just some other ones so that you're aware. Uh, psalms 55, 59, 69, 79, and 109. Um, are also considered imprecatory psalms as well. Some scholars uh, consider more. The, the, the number isn't exact, but these here, if you look, you'll be able to spot, oh yeah, these are imprecatory psalms. We'll talk some about, one, uh, about Psalm 69 tonight as well. So the question on the table is, what should we as Christians do with the imprecatory psalms? To be more specific, not just what should we do, but what should, how should we think about them? Like, just what should our mindset be when we read them? How should we feel about them? What type of emotions should we be feeling as we read these? And then lastly, practically, what do we do? Do they play any role in our Christian life today? Uh, So our outline is very simple. First, we're going to look at these kinds of psalms in their original context. Just what did this guy mean and what situation was he in in Psalm 137? Uh, Second, in li- uh, we're going to look at these psalms in light of the New Testament. Did something change when we came to the New Testament? If so, what? If not, then how does that affect how we view these psalms? And then third, imprecatory psalms in the church today. We're going to try to get real practical and, and, and say in good conscience, hey, this is a way that we can use them. Disclaimer, not every Christian agrees on this. Not even every Christian in what you'd call the Reformed camp agrees on this. This is not a hill that people usually die on, um, nor is it a hill that you should die on as well. So if you leave here thinking, I don't quite agree with Matt on this point or that point, that's totally okay. My desire is just that you would learn a a lot about these psalms and kind of wrestle with your own decision on that. Um, It's not a question that God's going to ask you at the pearly gates what you think of imprecatory psalms. So, uh, first, we're going to look at them in their original context. So, if you have a Bible, having Psalm 137 in front of you would be helpful. If not, I'll have some verses here on the screen again. Um, so, this psalm is, is the author remembering what it was like to be in exile in Babylon. It seems like he's not in Babylon anymore because he's referring to it in past tense. But at one point, he was dragged away to Babylon, and he remembers what it was like to be held captive there. And in verse 3, as a way of mocking them, the captors say, Hey, sing us some of your hymns. Sing us some of those songs of your great so-called God. Sing us some of those happy hymns that Israel's so well known for. And, And they wanted to hear these as a type of entertainment to add insult to injury. Uh, But in verses 4 through 6, you can see him say that, like, hey, singing this type of song in this type of setting under these circumstances, under the mockery of an enemy, would be inappropriate. He's saying we're not going to sing the praises of Yahweh as entertainment for our captors. And what's really interesting is that the first curse pronounced in this psalm is a curse upon himself. Look what he says in verse 5. He's saying, if I forget you, O Jerusalem, make me forget how to play music. That's essentially what he's saying. Would my, would my hands forget how to play the harp? Would my voice forget how to sing uh, if I ever misuse this gift of music that you've given us? Uh, and then in verse 7 is when the psalm really starts to turn. And he asks God to carry out a curse on two different enemies. The first is Edom in verse 7. Long story short, when the Babylonians were coming to attack Israel and Judah, uh, the Edomites didn't help protect Judah. Instead, they cheered on the Babylonians and said, hey, there we go, like lay it on thick, give them your worst. And if you remember who the Edomites were, they're the descendants of Esau, the brother of Jacob. So these are like essentially cousins of the Israelites. And they're saying, Babylonians, let them have it. So that is very sad to think about. 
Uh, but then the more severe curse is on Babylon. I'll read verse 8 and 9 again. Uh, verse 8, O daughter of Babylon, doomed to be destroyed, blessed shall he be who repays you with what you have done to us. Blessed shall he be who takes your little ones and dashes them against the rock. So how should we understand these curses at the end? Uh, and what universe is a prayer like this even appropriate? Well, here's a few crucial things that I think we need to know. Um, one is that this isn't a prayer for personal vengeance. This isn't just like this guy was angry about something that was done only to him, and he has like some specific family in mind that he wants to die. Uh, this also isn't expressing a desire for he himself to kill a Babylonian child. Th th this isn't him saying, Lord, I want to do this. Rather, he's calling on God to act. Uh, this isn't a call for other Israelites to take up arms. This isn't saying, hey, people of God, let's carry out a slaughter of the Babylonians. That's not what he's saying. It's ra he's asking God to do this. The he in verses 8 and 9 is Yahweh. He's asking God to bring judgment upon Babylon. He wants God to bring upon judgment. It's, it's not, he's not saying, hey, we need to go on some sort of jihad and, uh, and carry out this type of destruction ourselves. But why children? This is the hardest part. Why this specific request about their children? Well, look at verse 8, the second half of verse 8, where he says, Blessed shall he be who repays you with what you have done to us, speaking to Babylon. The author is simply asking God to repay Babylon for what Babylon has already done to them. When Babylon captured the Israelites and exiled them, in many, many cases, they slaughtered their children. So he's not saying, Lord, I have this really great idea that I just think you should do. He, he, he's rather, he, he's reflecting on the pain that's already been inflicted upon the Israelites. And he's saying, Lord, you're a just God. Would you carry out a just punishment? And for true justice to be fulfilled, it requires a punishment that fits the crime. So he's asking God to do no more than what was already done to them. So that's important to figure out. It's, it's still a hard pill to swallow, but this is coming from the perspective of a nation whose their own children were already dashed against the rock. Now they're saying, Lord, could you make things right? You're a just God. But not only that, the psalmist is even claiming certain promises of God in this psalm. If you remember uh, when God first spoke to Abraham in Genesis chapter 12, what was one of those promises that he gave him? Genesis 12, 3, I will bless those who bless you, and him who dishonors you I will curse. Anyone who persecutes you, anyone who touches my chosen people, I will curse. So he's claiming that promise. Lord, would you make do on that? But not only that, the Lord had even already made specific promises to judge Babylon. Look at Jeremiah 51. He says, I will repay Babylon and all the inhabitants of Chaldea before your very eyes for all the evil that they had done in Zion. Or even Isaiah 13, 6, uh, which is also a prophecy about Babylon saying their infants will be dashed in pieces before their eyes, their houses will be plundered, and their wives ravished. So again, the psalmist isn't just like, Lord, I have this wonderful idea that I think you should carry out. He's rather saying, Lord, you've, you've promised this. Our people are hurting, are in trouble, and if the Babylonians aren't stopped, this is going to carry on forever. Lord, will you act according to your promises? So just as a summary of Psalm 137, this is a desperate cry for help, or he's reflecting on a desperate cry for help. Um, the psalmist asks God to do whatever he must do in order to protect his people and fulfill his promises. He asks God to carry out a punishment that fits the crime. This is a call for faith, not a call to bear arms. 
He's not saying, people of God, let's go do this. He's saying, Lord, would you carry out your justice in how we believe you've promised it? So that's how we understand Psalm 137 in its original context. And, and, and I think just those reminders uh, would really apply to many imprecatory psalms as you read them. Uh, but second, imprecatory psalms in light of the New Testament. A common view, or maybe even just a gut instinct in the common Christian, is like, okay, I think something must have changed in the New Testament to where, like, these types of prayers are totally out. Like, when we, when we read them, it's just like, oh, man, look how God's people used to pray. But, you know, now, like, something has, has radically changed. And uh, maybe there's, a, there's an element of truth in that, but we, want to, we always want to be careful whenever we say there's a change from the old to the new. We don't really want to say that unless the New Testament says itself that something has changed. There are certain things that the New Testament has been incredibly clear on. Like, for instance, no more kosher laws, Gentiles, grafted. And there's things that are very, very clear. But when we look closer at this topic of imprecations or imprecatory psalms, you might be surprised at what you find in the New Testament. One is that it seems like the New Testament is never embarrassed by these psalms. Well, what do you mean by that? The New Testament itself quotes the imprecatory psalms. Psalm 69 is known as an imprecatory psalm. And uh, John chapter 2, verse 17, uh, it's after Jesus cleanses the temple. You know, he flips the tables, if you remember that story. And then uh, the author, John, quotes Psalm 69, 9, that says, zeal for your house will consume me. Why is that significant? Because... Well, later in that very same psalm that John quotes, you have seven straight verses of curses like these here. I'm not going to read all of them, but just some of them. Let their own table before them become a snare. and When they are at peace, let it become a trap. Uh, verse 24, pour out your indignation upon them and let your burning anger overtake them. May their camp be a desolation. Let no one dwell in their tents. Uh, Verse 28 at the bottom here, let them be blotted out of the book of the living. Let them not be enrolled among the righteous. And that psalm is quoted, not, now not these verses specifically, but at least this psalm is quoted in John chapter 2. But that's not it. Jesus himself quotes this psalm. In John chapter 15, verse 25, he quotes verse 4 of Psalm 69. Um, which says, uh, they hated me without a cause. So in fact, Psalm 69, which is an imprecatory psalm, you see it here at the bottom, is the second most quoted or alluded to psalm in the New Testament. Psalm 110 is the most quoted or alluded to psalm. Psalm 69 is the second. And it happens to be an imprecatory psalm. Now, you might say, if you look at these references, most of the time the curses themselves aren't being quoted. It's just other parts of the psalm that are being quoted. But you don't just want to assume, okay, they're, they're quoting all these verses from this psalm, but there's like this seven-verse chunk that just no longer applies. And you especially won't think that when you realize that the New Testament has its own imprecations too. It doesn't even have to borrow from the Psalms in some situations. Like Matthew 23, Jesus pronounces woes on the Pharisees. Comes across a lot like an imprecation. Matthew 26, Jesus pronounces a woe on Judas, says, Judas, it would even be better if you had never been born. It's a very serious curse. Uh, others, 2 Timothy 4.14 this is the Apostle Paul says, Alexander the coppersmith did me great harm. The Lord will repay him according to his deeds. Or also the Apostle Paul in Galatians 1, 8 and 9, where he says, uh, but even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to the one we preached to you, let him be accursed. As we have said before, so now I say again, um, if... Anyone is preaching to you a gospel contrary to the one 
that you received, let him be accursed. It, just to cut through and, and to tell you how serious this is that Paul's saying, he says, if anyone preaches a false gospel, let him go to hell. That's what Paul's saying. Let him be accursed. Let him be anathema. Um, and then Revelation 6, 9 through 10 uh, these are martyrs. These are dead. The, the vision is of dead Christians that were martyred for the, fa- for the faith. In heaven, they're crying out to the Lord. And uh, in verse 10, it says, They cried out with a loud voice, O sovereign Lord, holy and true, how long before you will judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth? So the New Testament itself has plenty of these kinds of prayers especially this last one in Revelation 6, asking for God to avenge them and carry out judgment. Uh, so it, it, it doesn't seem like the New Testament is embarrassed of or apologizes for these kinds of prayers, but the New Testament does give us something very helpful. And this is where it doesn't get so dark, is that the New Testament has safeguards to prevent us from misusing these types of prayers. Because the argument that I'm going to be making is that there is an appropriate way to use them, but there's also a very inappropriate way to use them. And the Bible, especially the New Testament, is very concerned that we don't use them inappropriately. In fact, they give us many examples of it used inappropriately. We see a few of these in the Sermon on the Mount. Matthew chapter 5, this will be familiar to you. Jesus says, you have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say to you, do not resist the one who is evil. But if anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. Uh, So when he quotes eye for an eye and tooth for a tooth, this is a saying quoted straight out of the Old Testament. And and, and what what this means is that the punishment should fit the crime. And not only that, the punishment shouldn't exceed the crime. Right? If someone knocks your tooth out, it's not just if you knock their eye out. That would be unjust. That would be way too harsh of a punishment. So this kind of strict punishment, fee, uh, punishment meets the crime law was, in fact, more gracious than a lot of other nations that didn't worship God or didn't worship Yahweh because they would have harsher punishments. So Jesus here isn't correcting the Old Testament. He's not, he, he's, he's not saying eye for an eye, tooth for tooth is wrong. That's not what he's doing here. What he's doing is that in his day, people were misusing this for personal vengeance. This eye for eye, tooth for tooth had to do with their justice system, judging cases. It wasn't about getting personal vengeance on your enemies. So what Jesus is saying here, do not resist the one who is evil, but if anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to him, the other also. The the main point is, don't confuse the justice of God with personal vengeance. The justice of God isn't on your shoulders to carry out. That's the point that Jesus is getting to here. So you can imagine how someone could misuse an imprecatory psalm for personal revenge rather than a just cry for help. Uh, Also here, right after this passage, you've heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Um, We want to be as balanced as the Bible is balanced. That's That's a very important quote from one of my favorite professors, Mr. Dr. Kara out of RTS Charlotte. He always said, be as balanced as the Bible is balanced. Don't like, like, Always check yourself with something that that might emphasize something different uh, because we believe all of the Bible. So I don't think we can take this to mean that we should never pray imprecatory psalms. But I believe what Jesus is saying is that they aren't our first resort. If anything, they're our last resort. We always lead with loving our enemies. It, it's, it's not like, man, I was persecuted at work today. God, would you rain down fire from heaven? That's not our first resort. <laughs> That's a very much last resort in a very dire, even life-threatening circumstance. I'll give you an example of when the disciples ju- jumped the gun and, and resorted to an imprecation as a first resort. Luke chapter 9. Um, the context here is that 
you know, they're going through trying to share the gospel, Jesus and his disciples. Uh, and I'll, they go into Samaria, and I'll start in verse 53. But the people did not receive Jesus because his face was set toward Jerusalem. And when his disciples, James and John, saw it, they said, Lord, do you want us to tell fire to come down from heaven and consume them? But Jesus turned and rebuked them. And they went on to another village. Jesus said, guys, this isn't the time. This isn't the place. I'm literally on my way to a cross. This isn't the time to call down curses. Rejection is part of my mission. We don't jump at every single rejection and ask God to curse them with fire. So James and John were a bit trigger happy with imprecatory prayers, and we don't want to be. Uh, so at this point, you're probably, w- as we're trying to be as balanced as the Bible's balanced, you're probably feeling this tension. At least I hope you are. You're like, okay, we have these prayers that call down curses on God's enemies, but we're also told to love our enemies and, and, and to not use these prayers as a first resort. How am I supposed to reconcile these two in my mind? How do we reconcile imprecatory prayers while also loving our enemies? And I think if, while I'm throwing a bunch of scripture at you tonight, I think one of the most important verses to really understand all of this is Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12 from the Apostle Paul. I'll read a few verses here. Uh, I'm going to read verse 14, 17, 19 through 21. Paul says, very similar to Jesus, bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse them. Repay no one evil for evil, but give thought to do what is honorable in the sight of all. Key verse 19. Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God. For it is written, vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. To the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. And if he is thirsty, give him something to drink. For by doing so, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Did you catch what Paul cited as our motivation to love our enemies? There's many places in the Bible that say God loved you while you are an enemy, therefore you should love your enemies, which is true, but it's not what Paul says here. According to Romans 12, verse 19, one motivation to love our enemies is actually the wrath of God. Well, how does that play out? The point is, God will judge his enemies, so you don't have to. And so I don't have to. What a weight that takes off of our shoulders, right? Never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God. God will fight the enemy so you don't have to take matters into your own hands. That's a wonderful truth. Maybe you're familiar with a man named Dietrich Bonhoeffer. He was a pastor in Germany when the Nazis took over, and he resisted the Nazi regime. And uh, he was not a man who was uh, accustomed to violence, but he actually uh, took part in an assassination plot to kill Hitler. It was unsuccessful. He was caught and eventually executed. And before he was executed, someone asked him, because he talked about loving enemies, someone asked him before he was executed by the Nazis, how could you have such love for such evil people? And this is what Bonhoeffer said. I don't have it on a slide, but this is what he said. It is only when God's wrath and vengeance are hanging as grim realities over the heads of one's enemies, that something of what it means to love and forgive them can touch our hearts. He's saying, if it wasn't for the wrath of God, I couldn't love them. Because I would have no peace about justice actually being handled. So Bonhoeffer is a great example of how we could leave that to the Lord. Now you could say, well, he did take part in an an assassination plot for Hitler, That's a whole nother equipping night uh, about pacifism versus not. But you could say this is a part of just war theory. Taking out Hitler was very much justified. Uh, So that's what the New Testament has to say about imprecations. Again, you're not going to find the answer all in one verse, but trying to be as balanced as the Bible's balanced. 
But what about in the church today? How, how do we use them <laughs> as Christians? Well, I, here's a few suggestions. One is that we learn from them. The Bible is the revelation of God. It's God revealing himself to us. So just anytime you read a passage of scripture, I would do this with youth students all the time. They'd be in a Bible reading plan. They're like, I'm in Leviticus. I don't know what to do. And, and one question I'd say is, hey, if you're in a passage, you just don't know what to do with it, at least ask yourself this. What does this passage tell you about God? What do the imprecatory psalms tell us about God? Well, one, they tell us about his justice. Uh, we see the justice of God. All wrongs will be made right one day. All evildoers will be punished. We can rejoice in the fact that someone like Hitler will stand before God. If, 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 if putting a bullet to his own head was really the end of it for him, that wouldn't be just at all with everything that he did. So we can rejoice in God's justice. <clears throat> we also see the faithfulness of God. Remember uh, how the psalmist in Psalm 137 was actually claiming specific promises of God to protect his people. Uh, he protects his people. He always stays true to his covenant no matter what, no matter how dirty God has to get his hands. He stays true to his promises. And perhaps one of the most important things we can learn from this psalm is, and I'm going to try to not take too long to explain this, but that God's salvation for his people, the third bullet point here, God's salvation of his people requires the judgment of his enemies. In most cases, when God saves someone, he also has to judge someone. Just think about the storyline of Scripture. To save Noah and his family, God judged the entire world. To save the Israelites out of slavery, he judged Egypt. But then when the beautiful thing is that when you think of the gospel, God flips the whole thing on its head and says, to save my enemies, I'm going to judge my son. Not for his sin, because he had no sin, but for our sin. So you see that even in our own salvation as Christians, God had to judge our sin. And praise God that he didn't judge it on us. He carried out those curses on Christ. That's what the cross was. It was a curse. When you think about um, in the book of Numbers, you know, when, when God gives Aaron, the priest, the, the blessing to give, may the Lord bless you and keep you, let his face shine upon you and give you peace. The cross was Jesus experiencing the exact opposite of every one of those things. May the Lord curse you and turn his face away from you and give you terror. Jesus experienced the curse of God for sin on the cross to save us. So salvation comes through judgment. So we learn from them. They tell us about God. Uh, second, we should realize that we imply them in our prayers more often than we think. Have you ever prayed the Lord's Prayer? Thy kingdom come. What's going to happen when Jesus' kingdom comes? Not everyone's going to be saved. Those who trust in Jesus are, but those who don't have a tough road ahead. Or <laughs> come, Lord Jesus. Jesus, come soon. Prayers that we should pray, prayers that wouldn't be controversial if you prayed it. But there's an implied imprecation there. So just come in. I'm not telling you to stop praying those prayers. Please keep praying them, but just to come to the reality of, hey, when I pray, the, this is a very serious prayer that I'm praying. So if I'm praying, Lord Jesus, come soon, what does that mean for my neighbor who doesn't know him? And if I'm going to pray that, I better be urgent with them. You know, Philippians 2 says, every knee shall bow and every tongue confess, but not every one of those knees and tongues will be saved. They'll all confess that Jesus is Lord. Then lastly, we can pray them, but with caution. So uh, one of the, I forgot to mention this at the beginning. You might say, Matt, why did you want to talk about this topic? It's because if you've been coming to worship with us, you've seen that we've been emphasizing the Psalms for the month of January. We've given you a Psalms reading plan to take you through the Psalms twice in an entire year. Um, if you don't have one of those plans, let me know. I can get one, or there's, they're in a, a table in the lobby. 
Um, but you're going to come across these psalms. And we want you to be able to pray these psalms in your own words. So when you come across Psalm 55, 55 69, 137, I don't want your quiet time to be terrible that day. I want you to at least have some suggestions of like, what can I do with this? So here's a few suggestions. One is be quick to pray them against Satan, much slower to pray them against humans. Ask God to curse Satan all day. You can't pray that enough. Don't do that for just your worst enemy. Uh, never pray, second bullet point, never pray these for personal revenge. That was never appropriate in the Old Testament, definitely not appropriate in the New. Uh, pray it as a last resort, not a first resort. Take, for example, a Hamas terrorist. The first prayer is, Lord, would you, would you save them? Would you change their hearts and, and make them love you, Lord Jesus? That Wouldn't that be amazing? You've heard testimonies of, of terrorists that were saved and have come to know Christ. That's amazing. That's the first prayer. The second prayer is, Lord, if you don't save them, you have to do something. Don't do nothing. Either save them or stop them. But Lord, act now. Do something because people are dying. So they're not a first resort, but a last resort. Next, it's a great way to pray for the persecuted church. It's, it's, it's um, very rarely, even though persecution and thi- it's harder to be a Christian in America than it once was, but you're probably not going to find yourself in a life-threatening persecution situation in the United States. But some believers, m- many believers are. And it's a great way to align yourself with them. Put yourself in the position of a persecuted Christian and pray this on their behalf. Lord, would you stop them? Lord, would you put an end to them? Uh, And then lastly, use them to pray against anti-God ideologies and institutions. And I'm not going to go on a rant on what I think all those things are. But a few examples. Pray and this isn't th- this doesn't necessarily mean the death of people. I just mean the, the the death of these institutions, closings of these businesses. Pray that, like Paul said, any church that preaches a blasphemous, false gospel, pray that they would close their doors. I'm not talking about a church that has a minor theological disagreement with us. I'm talking about a church that says, yeah, the Bible is not the word of God. Pray that their doors would shut. Because they're hurting people. Pray that abortion clinics would go out of business. Pray that gender reassignment surgery for children would become illegal. Pray for leaders of human trafficking to be captured. And for those that are caught up in human trafficking to be set free. These kinds of prayers are great prayers to pray on behalf of the helpless and the oppressed. So those are a few examples for you. I'll close uh, with this, and we'll have uh, some time for discussion, um, discussion and prayer. There was a, uh, a pastor that I wasn't familiar with, but I found this quote. His name was F. G. Hibbard, and uh, he did. F- he lived in the 1800s. He did family worship, family devotions with his family, and they just kind of went through the Psalms, and they came across one of these imprecatory Psalms. And his uh, his ten year old son, when he heard this. Uh, said, Father, do you, think it r- do you think it's right for a good man to pray for the destruction of his enemies like that? And this 10-year-old really knew his Bible because he said, what about Jesus saying you should love your enemies? And the father, Hibbert, he paused, he thought about it for a little bit, and then he responded with this. Uh, he said, my son, if an assassin should enter the house by night and murder your mother and then escape, and then the sheriff and the citizens were all out in pursuit trying to catch him, would you not pray to God that they would succeed and arrest him, that he would be brought to justice? And the little boy said, oh yes, but I never saw it so before. I did not know that was the meaning of these psalms. And then the quote that I have up here was his response. He said, yes, my son, the men against whom David prays were bloody men, men of falsehood and crime, enemies to the peace of society, seeking his own life, key part, and unless they were arrested and their wicked devices defeated, many innocent persons must suffer. 
That's why we can, and in my opinion, even should pray in precatory psalms within the guidelines that the New Testament gives us. Um, so this officially ends at 730. No one's going to make you go home at exactly 730. But just so you know, there'll be a, a reception with like some cookies and, and refreshments outside on the back of your handout. Uh, I wish I had finished sooner so we'd have more time. On the back of your handout are some discussion questions and also some suggestions for prayer. Here's what I'll say. In the, in the 10 minutes that we do have, split off into a group of like three to five people, and you can choose. You, can, you probably have enough time either for discussion or for some of these prayer suggestions. Your group can decide um, what would be most helpful to you. Uh, so... Uh, yeah, discussion questions or prayer time, and at 7.30, there'll be refreshments outside. Let me pray for us. Father, I pray that you'd help us be as balanced as the Bible's balanced, and you've given us these prayers for a reason. I pray that you'd help us use them rightly and not use them inappropriately. God, we pray especially for those whose life are being threatened because they profess faith in you. Would you guard them and protect them and bring their enemies to an end? We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.